Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's just a couple minutes before we'll get started, but I wanted to make some introductions and just simply some housekeeping things. First of all, we're really happy if all of you could join us here for part two of our Extension Feedlot Short Course Webinar Series. Uh, we're really excited for the program that we have today on uh, facilities and environmental management, and we look forward to a great session. As always, we'll be recording this, uh, that, and then we'll be sending you out a link uh, by email to access the recording as soon as that is ready. Uh, last week, we were able to get that done on Friday. We uh, hope perhaps by tomorrow, or if not, uh, we're looking at the first part of next week. Uh, as before, uh, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, go ahead and do so. Uh, raise your, uh, the, use the raise your hand option if you have some, need some help or assistance. Uh, I'll be monitoring the questions through the Q&A section and or also the chat. Uh, so when, when Dr. Lowe wraps up, uh, then we'll open up, the, open up for any questions you folks might have. Again, I also want to make sure to recognize our speakers. Uh, we are uh, really happy for the support from CHS Nutrition, Dakota Land Feeds, and Zoetis Animal Health. I uh, appreciate their support of the program. Our speaker today is Dr. Eric Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe is a uh, consultant with Midwest PMS. Uh, prior to that, he was a uh, Extension Feedlot Specialist here at South Dakota State University uh, and has worked with a wide number of uh, cattle feeders in the upper Midwest. And I asked if he would share some of his insights in terms of management of facilities, uh, both different barn types as well as open yards and try to provide some information to help folks manage cattle to manage around the sometimes often challenging weather conditions we have to deal with in the feeding industry. Uh, with that, I will uh, uh, turn off my camera and turn the floor over to Dr. Lowe. All right. Everybody, uh, Warren, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Very good. All right, very good. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, um, uh, uh, like, like Warren said, I'm, I'm, uh, I work with feedlot cattle in this region. I spend time with uh, cattle feedlots in, in uh, South Dakota, Nebraska. Uh, Iowa, uh, Minnesota, and in North Dakota, so very much in the upper upper um, plains feeding region. And I'm going to go through um, some different uh, different I have management practices in uh, different types of facilities. The cattle, the feedlots that I do work with, range from um, just regular dirt pens, traditional dirt pens with uh, uh, concrete aprons to um, slatted floor barns. So a wide variety of different facilities are used in this feeding region. And uh, uh, my client base would uh, would have those. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and uh, and then get going on the presentation. All right, um, we're going to talk about facility management, uh, open yards and barns. And since I I'm a, a work as a nutritionist, there's going to be a little bit of uh, discussion on some uh, composition of rations, primarily just in how they may impact the uh, you know, the more of the um, more the tighter uh, managed cattle in the, in barns. Um, with the design management of these facilities, the, the 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 design of the facility is critical to how the cattle are going to perform, how easy it is to maintain the facility, and so on. And it, with that, most designs of the of feedlot facilities do work if it's managed right. There are better or, or more easily managed facilities, but with the right management practices or the diligence of the of the uh, cattle feeder, the, most facilities can work as long as they're appropriately managed. There's specific amenities uh, based on the location. That's primarily what how they deal with weather, um, the the weather environment that they're in, the specific cold, mud, heat, um, wind, all of those different things that are that are altered based off of the, of the facility that is being used. The, like I said, I, I work with, uh, with feedlots in the, in the upper Midwest, in the Great Plains area. So we're gonna have um, a variety of different types of pen conditions, primarily dirt surface pens. And the, with, with mounds, some have mounds, some don't. Um, quite a, a large number of feedlots are now having a lot more concrete. So we'll have from eight to 40 foot aprons. There are a number of concrete surface pens, which were pens that were the first step towards uh, a more easily managed pen based off of the um, environment is just a concrete surface pen. Um, 
there are dirt and concrete surface pans with sheds that, that cover the bunks or the front, the north part of the bunk typically. There are pens with uh, bedding areas in them where the bunk is separate from the bedding area, but there's an area where cattle can get under shade or have a bedding area. A bed pack building, meaning a, a barn where a bed pack is maintained through the entire feeding period and the cattle are bedded routinely. And then the deep pitted barn, and now we are adding mats to those barns. So there's five predominant facility types that we use. Objectives are simply to provide a great environment for the cattle. We want cattle to be able to, to be comfortable, gain well, remain healthy based off the environment that they're in. Obviously we want to have access to feed and water in that facility and, and the, most, the better ease to get to feed and water, obviously that's a goal. Um, a comfortable place to lay down. Cattle resting is critical for them to be able to maintain performance. Um, we want to protect from cold and protect from heat. I'm going to go through and just share uh, pictures of different facilities uh, from this from the region, just to kind of um, break down just uh, some of the specific uh, attributes that that many different feedlots have. And there, there's such a such a wide variety of uh, facilities in this region. This is a picture of a feedlot that has it, it's a, a dirt um, pen, just it's just a um, all open yards. Um, and it was built uh, years ago. It's, a, it's been in production for many, many years, and it's a, more of a sandy um, soil profile. Cattle stay very clean. Cattle perform very well in it, and just because of, of the, the sand in the, the sand that they're on. So there are those those um, attributes in, in certain areas of this region. Um, we deal with a lot of pens that are relatively flat, and in those pens, if if mounds aren't, aren't put in or are less available to be put in, we add in quite a bit of concrete. So this feed yard, relatively flat as you can see here, and this feed yard does have approximately 20 feet of concrete um, right off the apron. That allows for cattle to be um, more, of the, more of the moisture, more of the, the manure is up towards the bunk, so it's more easily cleaned a better place to bed the cattle, just a, a overall better environment by having a flat pan, offsetting that with more concrete um, it aids in the cattle comfort. Uh, this is a facility that's um, a well-managed facility, all dirt pens. Uh, they, these pens have mounds in them and the mounds are past the, the water fountain. So there's ele some elevation to get away from any of the damp conditions and allow better pen grooming. A facility that, that's uh, well maintained and keeps a bit the, the dirt pens hard and allows them to allows water to drain. Um, the the first barn that we're going to talk about, and we'll go into a little bit more depth and specific aspects of bedding in just a little bit. But this is a, a bedding barn, so this would be a um, a barn that has a bed pack in it throughout the year. This facility itself has bunks just on the south side, and the cattle have a or maintain a bed pack in the center of the pen. This is a picture of the of the bed pack in this facility. In this instance, you're going to see this. This doesn't look truly like you know bedding. The corn stalks were put on there, but this is ground corn stalks that are actually they're ground and then put in here, and, they, and you can see how compacted they get. These corn stalks have a little bit of age to them, so they break down and make a very hard bed pack. It allows the moisture to be off the area where cattle will be, will be resting and lying down. A picture of a, a monoslope that monoslope barn, a bed pack barn, that the pen depth is 100 feet. So the, the barn is wider than that, but the pen itself is about 100 feet deep. In here, the the slope of the roof allows sunlight to get into the back of the pen in the winter, and it covers all of the pen in the summer. So there's shade pretty much in 100% of the pen in the summer, and access to or there's light in there in the winter. This is a picture of, of, of calves, uh, freshly bedded calves being freshly weaned calves in the fall. This facility does um, work well for starting calves. They're clean, they're out of the elements, allows cattle to be very well protected in, in what we get up here in the fall with some early uh, freezing rains, drizzle, it keeps them out of that and out of those elements. 
this is a video that I'm, that I'm going to start in just a, a couple seconds. But what I want to show here, this is a slatted floor barn that has a bunk on the north and south side. In this barn, you, the it acts, actually has you know, double the, the bunk space than the, the early built slatted floor barns, where a lot of those barns just had the bunk on, on one side or the other. This, this facility is just over 50 feet foot deep hand and and there are uh, bunks on both sides like I said these cattle in this video had just arrived prior to the video being taken and you can see just the access that, that this allows them to have to feed all right so these are yearling steers that came in and you can see where there's, they're really spread out. This is the first portion of that pen to be filled. There's going to be more, there'd be more cattle that would come in after uh, these had arrived. But you can just see how much space these cattle have when we, have, when we can get more access to bunk space. A critical aspect of these barns is access to feed, access to water. So having, having water fountain space either um, on all walls or a large tank in the center of the pen, allowing access to water and feed as it being a critical comp component to the, um, the how cattle perform in these barns. Facilities are not new to this region. This is a picture of a feedlot that, yeah, that uh, was built in Northeast Nebraska many, many years ago by a true um, pioneer in the cattle feeding business. And he saw the need for, for facilities to Help with help with a wind, help with uh, add shade, protect cattle to improve their health and their well-being and performance, but also protect the investment of the cattle themselves. Just because they are they are purchased to gain and purchased to produce beef, and we need to protect uh, protect their health, protect their for their performance and the investment that the, the cattle owner themselves have. So facilities are nothing new. They've just been continually altered in a way that makes them more easily managed to, to, to really um, make the most of, the, of any one uh, feedlot operation by itself. Facilities, however, are not necessary when feeding cattle. This is a, a picture of, of calves after they've been weaned and started, uh, put out on a corn stock field and fed and fed in a backgrounding um, situation in a South Central South Dakota. And here they're, there's a lot of calves in one large cornfield and they're fed there um, through the bulk of the winter and then moved to a feed yard to be finished. In, these, in this situation, calves can be really spread out, allows them to stay very clean. Uh, bunks are moved depending on the on the wetness around the bunks themselves into a into a space where it's clean again. But all cattle have a great place to lay down, spread out, get away from each other, and uh, you know spread the manure load out as well. And it's going to be farmed in next spring. Cattle comfort is is the is the key to what we're after. Um, is a, you know, how pens are maintained how pens are, are, uh, are bedded, all of those things become critical components to what uh, feed yard operators do uh, you know, anywhere in the world and, and in the, within my customer base, it, it's a, a huge deal just because of the moisture level, the um, amount of rain we get, the humidity that we have and the multiple types of facilities that are used. It, maintaining cow comfort is, is a critical component to what everybody does. And I'll repeat this again, but when you're thinking of, of pen maintenance, uh, always be thinking of, of whatever I whatever I do today is going to benefit these cattle 30 days or 60 days down the road. So the more that I get done today, the more maintenance I get done today is only going to benefit these pens down the road. So you, you get a month down the road or 60 days down the road, and you can and you might be thinking, I wish I had been doing more 30 or 60 days ago to keep my pens in better shape. Mud is one of the largest um, robbers of performance in most of the feed yards in this region, simply because of the moisture and the soil profile that most people have. Um, we tend to feed cattle to a little bit heavier weight, um, feed some really outstanding big growthy cattle. Now this picture is of, of, is of a steer that was fed in 2014. Uh, we fed cattle to a pretty heavy weight 
uh, in, at that point. And these cattle are tough on pens. They're heavy, they eat a lot, there's a lot of manure production and maintaining those pens becomes critical. If not, you know, it's gonna impact performance. Um, pen space and utilization of space is absolutely critical. In, in this picture, you can see um, a couple trails through the pen and, and the gray area are areas of the pen that the cattle are just not utilizing. If we can't utilize nearly 100% of the pen space, we are lacking in our pen maintenance. They need to be continually groomed, continually scraped so that water does shed off of those environment, off of those areas so cattle can utilize the entire pen. Because under those areas where it's gray here, it's wet. It's wet and deep and cattle, they step through, they're gonna sink. And it just, and it never, it takes so long to dry out. So continual pen maintenance is critical to make sure we utilize the entire pen space. With wet spots especially off the apron or in this case where the cat the this uh, steer stepped off of the the, the um, apron where the water fountain is located so that pad is of concrete where the, the water fountain is located first step is deep into mud this is going to typically decrease the amount of water these cattle consume which is a direct impact on dry matter intake in addition to that it's these situations that we can run into cattle that, that can get injured by either you know, pulling muscles, they can you know, hurt ligaments, they can do things that just make them less able to get around like they normally should. All resulting in less movement of those cattle to go and eat and drink and perform normally. The transient state of water in a feed yard. This is this is a situation that we that we work with every spring because every spring we do go through a thaw. Uh, the picture of of heavier cattle in February with a lot of moisture in this pen, and you can actually this pen at this point is there's wetness on top and it's frozen below. So at this point we're going through this process of thawing and getting rid of and, and not yet brought the frost has not yet come out of the ground. So how do we handle this? Because this, this picture was taken the same day this picture was taken and it's, a, it's bedding. In that previous pen, those cattle would be bedded that day because of the amount of moisture in that pen that we're gonna add a bedding pack right off the apron is where we can actually drive equipment, get cattle on an area where they can lay down in this pen, you can see there's wetness beyond where that bed pack is, but the bed pack is right off of the concrete apron. So it's easy access to feed, it's easy access to water, and they, they're gonna find areas in the other, other areas of the pen to lie down in to stay comfortable and rest. But a bed pack in appropriate areas of each pen is critical. I personally like it closer to the bunk, as long as that, that pen is designed in a way where, we're, where we can have that apron, um, have that bed pack close to the apron. This is uh, a data set that's been evaluated many times and discussed many times, but it's so important to put in perspective what we cattle potentially will lose in muddy pen situations. This is from uh, Dr. Terry Mater, University of Nebraska. Um, just in, in modeling what mud does to performance shows there's a, a significant increase in the maintenance requirement of cattle. So if we have a little bit of mud, go to six inches, go to 12 inches of mud in these pens, you can see there's a massive increase in the maintenance requirement. We typically don't have 12 to 18 inches of mud for an extended period of time. We are gonna manage that so that we either bed cattle or move cattle out of those pens. But it just as far as um, the theoretical loss in, loss in performance, this demonstrates just how significant it is. So you're gonna see a decrease in gain, which is obvious. You're gonna have a decrease in dry matter intake. And that's the, that just goes back to that calf that was, the Charlotte calf that was, that was dropping off of the concrete pad where that water fountain was that I showed earlier. In that pen, and if there's mud in that pen, it's not, it wasn't, 12 inches a month throughout the entire pen, but there were areas that were that were bad. That decreases the access to feed. They don't care to go up and eat, or they may overeat at time, all resulting in over time, less intake, higher 
to worse feed conversion, resulting in higher cost of gain. And if you just look at the cost of gain, if cattle gained 600 pounds in a feeding period, if we lost the, the performance that six inches that took that was taken away by having six inches of mud, it would cost us $15.60 per head more than it would at three inches, or just about $80 head more at 12 inches. So if we had 12 inches of mud for half the feeding period, depending on the weight of the cattle at that point, it's a significant loss in performance. So you can justify bedding, you can justify more concrete to get cattle in a more comfortable pen condition. Uh, as far as the process of getting rid of mud, it, it's just simply a diligence of being in the pens when you can be in the pens. And this is a scenario where if, if, if the pens are workable today, it, it's worth working them today. Getting any of the manure cleaned out, if it's muddy situations, getting the mud scraped, getting it smoothed out so cattle have access to more of the pen, they can lay it down. Because as soon as you do scrape a pen, cattle will populate that scraped area because it's more comfortable. And as the, as, as cattle are, the pen, the yards are scraped, cattle will spread out, they'll access feed easier. But that has to be done routinely just to make sure the pen conditions stay appropriate throughout the entire feeding period. This is an example of what we want the pen to look like after it's, after it's scraped. It's a hard pack and you can see these cattle are spread out. So this is what we want. We want cattle to look like this in the winter. And this was a, a picture of a, of a uh, Northeast Nebraska feedlot in the winter. And you can see cattle are spread out all over. They're very clean and the pens are incredibly well groomed. This is a picture of pens being scraped and you can see where they're just, they're going around the pen circle, getting it scraped. You can see the little bit of, a, of the, the um, rows that are that as, as the um, little windrow of, of uh, dirt as these pens are being scraped. But as this cattle, this, pen, this yard scrape, cattle are gonna spread out, they're gonna play, they're gonna be more comfortable. And as soon as we get any moisture, it's gonna more easily run off. Another picture of what we want a pen to look like we, when we place calves. The drain areas, the, the valleys, the draws in the pens are scraped, they're cleaned out. So if we do get rain, it's gonna flow out of the pen as designed. And all the mounds are hard and scraped and there's no dust. These calves are off to a really excellent start by just because of the diligence of getting those pens in great shape. Shade gets, is, is the next major major benefit of a pen in these areas because we have a lot of heat a lot of humidity this coming upcoming weekend we're going to be going into another really hot period and these shades are absolutely critical to maintaining performance of cattle getting them someplace to be that say that that's shady that they cool down and cattle will rotate through those shaded areas throughout the day they won't stand in there all day long but they will migrate through there these are permanent shades, they're permanent, um, permanent structures. The shade does bu bundle back up. It's kind of like a bio, kind of like a, um, uh, an accordion where they get tight together in the winter and then they, they spread them out in the summer to make sure there's shade over the areas of each of these pens. The, another picture of portable shades is a portable shade structure. And you can see cattle are gonna migrate in there. Yep not all the cattle are going to fit under all the shade all the time but they will rotate through them so you put them in in different areas of the pen primarily you want them close to the bunk or in, a, in an area where it's easy to clean underneath of them so cattle can access them go eat go drink and and uh, just stay cooling down this is a permanent shade structure that was built a long time ago. Uh, this is concrete under it, as you can see. And what I want to show with this is just that the temperature. So right now this, this handheld thermometer, infrared thermometer is, is uh, being held underneath the shade. And then as I walk out from underneath the shade to the sunlight, you can see the drastic increase in, in surface temperature. So there's gonna be a, a wide range in, in comfort or increased comfort under that shade. Now, a more transparent shade will have a little bit less of, of a difference between from underneath the shade to where it's in full sun. So that's gonna be shown here. And you're gonna see from starting underneath the shade again and then moving out from underneath of it. So the transparency or the percent shade does matter. 
So in this case, it went from the mid 60s, so 66 degrees, and it's going to raise up uh, just not nearly as hot as is that uh, in that other picture. So just over 90 degrees. So you can see there's there's not as large a difference. Again, this is a little bit. This is the same day, actual day, just a little bit different slope to the ground. So the, the temperature temperature of the uh, ground from underneath the or that's outside of the shade is a little bit different. Moving into a little bit of a discussion on on a, a different barns, a uh, picture of a of a barn uh, in Iowa that's actually a, a barn that has bunks on the north and south side. In most cases, barns are going to be part of a man of a of a feedlot. They're not going to be the sole uh, facility, but they can be. So they can have a barn only feedlots or their barns as part of a system. And in those cases, um, you put the right kind of the cattle in the barn during the, the time period that's most appropriate for those cattle to be in that facility. So you could consider it a priority pen placement if you if, if you want to consider uh, kind of look at it in that manner. A picture of a hoop building in North Dakota that that functions incredibly well. It's uh, well they do a nice job managing it, but you can just see the, the how how comfortable that area is and how hospitable it is on a really cold, windy night in North Dakota. Barns in general are either going to have less labor and less bedding or more labor and more bedding. It's really depending on what you want to do. So a bedding barn is where you, the labor and the bedding increases are. And then in a, in a slatted floor barn, there's a lot, lot less labor and obviously no bedding. Both are going to have higher overhead costs. And you and the, One's going to be offset by just less labor, um, and but a more upfront cost, like a slatted floor barn. Um, in these barns, there are nutrition management considerations, and when when looking at that and thinking about it, what I want to be it, it, the consideration that I'm really talking about is the composition of the diet, the digestibility of the feedstuffs so that we can really minimize the amount of manure that's being produced. And the manure value is, is really important. So, so what we, what not digest is gonna be go back out to crop ground, but we wanna minimize the amount of, of manure in those pens just so we have to either haul less or we get more days before that pit is full, as well as the, the thickness and the, the viscosity of, of the manure in the pit or just the ability to get the pit pumped. Um, Diet formulation, uh, most of the feed yards in this region um, feed cattle uh, on, of their own, and a lot of them would raise their own feed stuff. There's obviously many commercial feedlots as well, um, but we're gonna work with available feed stuff just like every feed yard does in, in its own specific region. Uh, cattle feeding program, you know, that can be looked at as days on feed, um, what we want is our ultimate outweight of these cattle and what environment considerations that we have to have when uh, placing cattle on feed and deciding just how many days on feed we want to be feeding these cattle. With that feeding program, this, that's what ties into this. And what, what I'm looking at or discussing is more of, in this region, we feed cattle a bit longer than they do further south in the United States. We do that for a couple of different reasons. First one is environment. We through the winter, we can't guarantee that we're going to have a perfect winter and we're going to be able to get cattle again exactly like we want. So we typically plan on feeding cattle just a little bit longer to make sure that we have the outweight that are, you know, get close to target outweight. And when I'm talking a little bit longer, we might be 30 days longer than they may be further south. This is an example of a feedlot um, just looking at what their placement weight was and the day, average days on feed or the days on feed for all of their closeouts over the past few years. I'm going to overlay the same information from a barn, from a bedpack barn, actually. And, and it, what we typically see is that for any one weight group, we typically see a fewer days on feed. So if we feed cattle, we're able to average day, fewer days on three weeks on feed. In this case, the comparison is 18 fewer days on feed in the bedding barn. And that does improve performance, but that is a benefit of having that facility so that we can either turn more cattle, have more have cattle in there at a more efficient weight throughout the time, or realize that these cattle are at a heavier weight 
earlier in the feeding period. So if we do feed them another three weeks or so, we, we know that we're gonna have a little bit more weight at that point. Uh, same comparison with conversion. So this is a big, a big uh, a database from a particular feedlot shows a very wide range of conversion. But remember that the placement weights of this yard will vary significantly for some short fed heavier cattle to some long fed light cattle. And the overlay at the conversion of cattle fed in the barn, it's just, it's a shift. We essentially are just shifting this performance into better conversion. And some of that's a little bit uh, fewer days on feed. They get the heavier weight earlier just because the environmental uh, stress or the impact is lessened. And that's, that should happen because that barn was built for that exact reason. The data set uh, that South Dakota State University put together uh, years ago um, with uh, um, the uh, cattle feeder down at the Opportunities Farm in uh, Southeast South Dakota. So um, a gentleman named Matt Lowy would, would feed these cattle, manage these cattle and run that operation. Um, and in that, the uh, um, researchers at SDSU uh, compiled the data from those closeouts. And what I wanna show here is comparison in, in the shift in conversion going from cattle fed in an open pen. So these are closeouts of cattle marketed in each of these months. So the number one means January, number 12 is February. So you can see where these closeouts or when these cattle were closed out. So I'm gonna overlay cattle fed in the partial facility. So the open pen is all dirt pen. The partial facility is a pen design that has, um, has a shed over the bunk and first, for first approximately 20 feet of that pen. And there's concrete under that shed and a little bit beyond it for a bedding area. So the partial facility had just a bit better perform, better conversion. So just that shift because of environment. And the uh, um, overlay of the monoslope, which is 100% under roof, cattle are bedded and stay under roof the entire time. So less movement, they're a little bit more efficient in that system. But it's just this shift. It's not, an, it's not a night and day change in performance, but it's a shift. There are times of year where it's just pace of cattle outside because pen conditions are perfect. When the weather isn't as perfect, having that protection is, is easily measured. Now, this is the performance. And in, on the labels here, you're gonna see kilogram. I, it's actually not kilograms. I put that in there. It was, a, it was an error, error of mine. I didn't change the kilograms to pounds, but the, the, actually the numbers are in pounds. So the weight is pounds. And you can see cattle that are fed either the the partial facility of the monoslope are heavier than the other cattle. Perform the gain is better. Eight, approximately the same. Again, these cattle are all under one management program. So these cattle are fed very similarly and approximately the same pounds per head per day. Uh, you can see that feed conversion, the feed to gain ratio was improved with the, with the facilities. And a lot of that was based off of the winter feeding. So the, the poorest performance of all cattle where cattle were fed in the open pen and they were closed out from the open pen in the first quarter of the year. So they had all of the, all of the winter weather on them and went out in the you know, early spring, late winter. Now bedding. Bedding is a massive discussion point that, that, that we have in the fall of the year and then in some facilities throughout the year. So just starting at the top of this slide, um, what I'm going to set up here is to show you that when bedding is done effectively and as needed, it maintains conversion. So more bedding is needed when an environment is the poorest to maintain cattle comfort. Now drop down to look at the, at the, at the graph, okay? On the x-axis, you're going to see bedding in pounds per head per day. On the uh, y-axis is dry matter conversion. What I want you to, to think about and, and take away from this is that the people that bed cattle and have bed, bedded cattle for a long time are really astute bedding readers. They, they read the amount of bedding that they, they read the cattle, they read the pen conditions to determine how much to bed cattle on any one day. It's really critical because you can overbed or underbed. Overbedding is essentially a unnecessary cost. Underbedding creates a situation where you got to catch up, and when you have to catch up to a wet pen, it takes a tremendous amount of bedding. But if those that 
bed well and bed effectively so they bed enough to keep the environment very very um very comfortable for the cattle essentially maintain conversion so the more bedding that was needed in this example of these closeouts resulted in really similar conversion so they bedded to the point where they maintained performance and didn't lose it because they the cattle were uncomfortable so if you look at the bedding range in this from these closeouts it ranged from $11.83 to $34 per head. If you look at the imp improvement in performance in that Holland data, where you looked at the barn cattle, the, the cattle that were in that monoslope versus cattle that are fed outside, the, this, the bedding cost wouldn't offset what that improvement in performance was. And that's for a facility, so that's for that barn. So depending on the kind of facility that you're looking at, the type of, of, of uh, expense you have in that barn, you have to be really careful to, to understand what the bedding cost is versus what the barn cost is. Because not always will we cover the cost of bedding and the cost of the facility, depending on what you're comparing it to. And keep that in mind, okay? Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into a, a discussion of when this bedding does pay for itself, okay? All right, bedding intelligence is something that we're gonna kind of frame this around. Those that know how to bed cattle or bed cattle very effectively, and, I, and you can call that bedding intelligence. In a picture of this picture of cattle, you can see where they're bedded down beyond a windbreak and they're comfortable laying down and resting. In 2019, uh, researchers at uh, SDSU put, uh, did a research experiment that was incredibly timely to demonstrate what bedding does for cattle. In there, they demonstrated that the, if you bed cattle versus not bedding cattle on a concrete pen through the winter in South Dakota, you're going to improve performance. Okay, this is, that's what you'd expect. That would have been the hypothesis that we would improve performance, and they did. If you look at what the cost of gain was or the feed conversion was for cattle that were bedded versus those that weren't bedded showed that, that the cost of gain would be such because of the poor performance for the cattle that were, that were not bedded, that you essentially pay for bedding whether you bed cattle or not. So in this case, the cattle that were bedded were, were much more efficient the cattle that were not bedded were actually fed more days to try to catch up to the outweight of the cattle that were bedded. So in this case, they're fed, um, I think, 20, just, a, just about a month longer, and they, they did weigh more. But if you take the added weight, the, the value of the added weight for the cattle that were not bedded, the improved feed conversion and lower total cost of gain for the cattle that were bedded, the cattle that were bedded were still more profitable, en enough more profitable that it would pay for the bedding and just a bit more, meaning that the loss of performance was such that you should have bedded cattle. You're paying for it whether you bed cattle or not when the, when the cattle need bedding. So again, know your bedding intelligence. We really be careful of that. It's a huge aspect of bedding cattle up north. Water, I just bring this up because every pen's got to have access to water. Uh, uh, wa enough access in these barns where they can easily get to it. So multiple fountains or one, e one large fountain so cattle can access it easily. Through the winter, cattle will drink a little bit less water, but they need, they need free access to it all the time to make sure we get um, dry matter intake. Diet digestibility in the floors. Um, the more digestible the ration is, the less manure that's gonna be on the floor and typically creating a better floor environment, less slippy, less, less chance for these cattle to, to slip and just have more stability, more footing. Um, that's important because at times getting up for these cattle is, is important to not have slippery floors. So the di digestibility does go into that. There's a perception out there that the wetter the ration, the worse the pen conditions are going to be. That depends on the, the digestibility of the feedstuffs that are wetter. If we have high moisture corn and we have high quality silage, it's a wetter ration. But that compared to a dry roll corn ration with, uh, with certain types of hay that may be a little bit less digestible, we're still gonna have a relatively similar 
um, pen conditions. But you have to watch what the diet composition is of feedstuffs and the highly digestible ration works better in these status floor bonds. In more of a comparison of the, of the diet type, this is gonna kind of show you what, what I was discussing before. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of a ration where I took the Penn State particle separator, separated out the, up the different uh, particle sizes to see, first of all, the mixed test of a ration that's fed to cattle in a barn. And in there, you can see that the, that the average particle length was just over four millimeters. Tight standard deviation, so it's a well-mixed ration. Now, we were having cattle do well with that ration, but we thought, let's try to get to a little bit less roughage and make this ration something that these cattle are not going to sort. In here, in that, that left, um, the lower particle size ration, you can see that we have obviously do have a smaller particle size. It's uh, going to be a little bit more digestible just since we have more corn and less hay in that ration. Comparing that to a ration that's, that is based off of corn stalks as a primary roughage versus in the ration on the right, which would be hay and corn silage, we have a very different distribution of particles. Even though the corn stalks have a little bit lower average particle size, primarily because that light, fluffy um, corn stalk material isn't as heavy as what the, the corn silage and hay is on that second screen on the on the right, we have, a, have an average a little bit higher for longer particle length with the hay silage ration than the other ration simply because of the, the density of, that, of the uh, cracked corn and, and the higher distillage grains level in the ration on the left. Now, the effect of NDF is different just because of, the, of what we have for the NDF, the total NDF in the ration on the left. But the ration on the left is just more sortable. If there's gonna be cattle that sort, it's gonna be them sorting corn stalks. And in a barn where we're, we're, we're tight on bunk space, it's critical that we make sure, it make, it's critical to have a ration that's not sortable. And that is the components of the ration that become very important so that the first group of cattle that come and eat when they're done eating and the second group of cattle comes that they have not sorted through and got the, a different ration consumed than what was fed. And that's why looking at how well that ration holds together in the bunk is really an important aspect of ration formulation in barns. Um, ration deliveries, it varies dramatically um, based off of a pen type cattle mixing equipment but in, the, in this region, there's going to, there will be cattle fed in the static floor barns that are fed once a day, uh, up to three times a day. And it's really depending on just the size of the mixing equipment and, and how fast you want to get cattle fed in the morning. So having three deliveries in, the mor in, the, in, the, in a yard allows you to get past more cattle in a barn fast so that you get, a, you get around right away in the morning. All cattle get access to feed quickly. You come back with that second feeding in the later part of the morning. That second group of that second wave of cattle, the second group of cattle will come up and eat, and then you just finish in the afternoon. So that is an excellent way to do it. The predominant way is a two times a day feeding system, where they're fed in the morning and then in the afternoon. That mod the modified two times a day feeding would be fed right away in the morning and then come back again and feed them in the late part of the morning. That may be as preferred a way to do it as you can since so that the second group of cattle that didn't have access to that first round gets fresh ration when they're, when they're still a little bit more hungry in the morning. Bunk management. Typically, uh, feed yards that I work with have a clean bunk management program. Um, we obviously want all cattle to have access to, the, to a fresh ration. Um, that's so that we want to make sure that cattle consume the, the, today's ration are ready for the ration tomorrow. But the biggest point in these barns is, is the sensitivity to the ration to go out of condition. We'll be a little bit more, we'll be the, to a certain higher level of moisture in most of these uh, diets that are fed. Uh, in that, with that moisture, heat and humidity, we can get the ration to go out of condition in the, throughout the day. And that becomes very negative for long-term feed consumption. So we want to make sure we have tight control on bunk management 
and be very sensitive and be very proactive in adjusting intake so that we do not get ahead of the cattle in the barn. Heat retention, and what I'm talking about there is just heat retention of a barn. Um, on hot days, cattle that are fed outside are gonna have their intake dip quicker than cattle fed in the barn. It's more of a delayed intake drop in a barn where those barns maintain heat for multiple days, especially if we just have three days of heat in a row, for example. On the, the third day and then the subsequent days, we'll probably see cattle in a barn intake linger where cattle outside might recover quicker just because their environment cools down. If it does cool down at night, with the barn may maintain that heat depending on the wind and how fast that barn cools down. But think of all of the concrete in that barn, the heavy cattle, the, the amount of cattle in there, there's a lot of heat that's maintained, a lot of heat that's produced, there's a lot of heat even in the concrete that's gotta, that's gotta dissipate for that environment to cool down. So it's, it's a really, it's more of a delayed uh, scenario. This is a graph just demonstrating that. Um, just look at the, the July 1st, 2019, so it was a year ago, uh, where we had a big heat event right at the beginning of July. Big drop in intake, cattle were brought back, dipped a little bit uh, kind of mid-July, and finally by the end of July, built intake back up. But that is a scenario in a barn where it's good, they're gonna have a, could it have a significant cut, come back hopefully as fast as the weather, as, as it cools down, but, but just that lingering heat through the month of July last year did make it so that some of these barns, we just, we didn't build intake back quickly but it's consistent. We didn't have drop after drop as long as we stay uh, with appropriate bunk calls post heat. Uh, another barn, and as an example, and if you look at this at the, the black line is dry matter intake. Again, look at that right at the beginning of July, where it had a big cut and cattle came back, but they just couldn't maintain, um, it couldn't maintain intake on these cattle. The, this is a different style building where they just didn't get intake back as fast as any other barn. And that's a lot to do with the style of barn that are being uh, built. Well, just the ability to have high sidewalls to get a lot of airflow through those barns and dissipate the heat out of the building as fast as you can. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going through performance range of cattle fed in barns, just to kind of get an idea you can kind of keep um, have an idea of just where what this range is that, that that's been observed on uh, closeout gains and intake and conversion of cattle fed in barns in the in this northern feeding region. Um, for um, average daily gain on, on the y-axis and then days on feed. What this shows is that cattle that have a have a normal distribution of gain relative to days on feed is cattle fed outside. But you can say that cattle, if, if you place cattle, you're going to be fed longer and more and more days. You could say that you're going to lose about 1,400 of a pound of gain as cattle are fed every, you know, for every 30 days. That's kind of what, that's what that slope says. Um, looking at in, at in weight, you can increase a, roughly a tenth of a pound per 100 pounds of weight. So that's just relatively a normal uh, relationship between gain and initial body weight. And that's important for barn cattle to, to show that they perform uh, with normal biological response in a barn as well. Now, one thing that that's interesting about intake is if you have the ability to, if you have a barn and you're going to place a specific cattle type, you're going to want to um, place cattle that have bigger intakes, have the ability to eat more feed. This shows that if you, the longer fed cattle, which would be lighter cattle, eat less. That's typical. Now this, this shows a little bit higher intake potential in, in a barn than what we might even see outside. And a lot of that's influenced by the people that have barns and the kind of cattle that they source for those barns. Um, as a rule, it's been learned to put big intake cattle in barns because they have, there's one thing that the barn may have is lower intake. So we do see with the right population, uh, it, a, a nice response intake for, for cattle. Typically, a little bit heavier cattle going to a barn allows us to have, to have fewer days in the barn, but the right kind of cattle maintain nice intakes. Um, feed conversion. 
um, you're going to see a trend up in conversion with heavier in weight cattle as exactly what you'd expect. Um, this is a comparison of, of uh, um, uh, two feed yards. And these feed yards are both um, static floor barns. They're different facilities, but they, they do thing, they, they both feed right around nine, about nine weight cattle. So they place cattle at about 900 pounds. The barn in the orange um, will feed cattle a few less days, but which also, that's why they go out at a little bit lighter weight. The cattle that are in the blue show that they're fed more days, uh, but they also go out at a, an average heavier weight. So how does that relate into performance? Just as you'd expect, the cattle that are fed fewer days and go out a little bit lighter weight do have a better conversion compared to the cattle that are fed a little longer days and to a heavier weight. Now, both of these operations understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But it's, it's a marketing scenario. I'm trying to get to certain market months. But that shows that if, if you're going to do those things, the barn absolutely helps compared to um, a pen that might be outside, might have more mud. But if we're going to feed cattle longer, the barn still isn't going to get, um, it's, it's not going to totally mask the, the increased maintenance requirement of those cattle the lower conversion, the poorer conversion as they get to a heavier weight. But if we know that we're going to feed cattle longer, we appropriately assign days on each ration. We know that we have a little bit poor performance by holding those cattle longer, but we can predict what that is going to be and work towards having a better predictability of cost of gain in that scenario. Um, just a, a couple more slides to go through. Um, and this is a pen movement. With pen movements, it's, it can be very negative no matter where you're feeding cattle, whether it's a dirt pen or in a barn. I think that in barns, they're more sensitive to dropping back off feed. And so I'm gonna go through and explain what this graph is showing. Each black line, each vertical black line is a point where cattle in this lot of cattle were moved. Now, the blue line is cumulative dry matter intake over the course of the feeding period. So that's pounds per head per day. The orange line is the actual feed delivery, dry matter feed delivered on that day. The, for the at day 60, we kind of peak cattle out on consumption and cattle were moved from an outside pen to an, to an, to an inside set of four barn. And we, an intake dipped severely and it, it slowly came back over the next days. Um, the second line was cattle, were, some of the cattle in the barn were moved to a different pen. That, at that point, intake stayed in the trend up. The third line, intake got dipped, intake dipped when cattle were moved again. The third line, the fourth line, intake just kept, it just didn't improve. The fourth dipped again, the fifth dipped again. So. It's not the cattle at every pen within that large lot was moved, but every time a pen within that lot was moved, it typically resulted in a drop in consumption. So everybody has to be very aware of that and minimize these pen to pen movements as much as possible, just because it can impact to, um, dry matter intake, which, there, which then will decrease the average daily gain. Um, to uh, wrap things up and, and uh, allow for some uh, time for questions, uh, if there are any, uh, just to go through the, the primary things that we've covered. Um, we looked at the different facilities. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of facilities and a lot of them work really well as long as you're, you um, work your management program around the facility that you have. Um, the pen maintenance is absolutely key to any pen, whether it's outside pens with a, with a mound, whether it's bedding barns, the, the pen maintenance and the ability to keep those pens in good shape is critical. Again, whatever you do for pen maintenance today is going to lead to good things down the road. And if, if people that have horrible pen conditions that could have been prevented to some extent at some point by having better pen maintenance earlier, most PDRs will have 
bad hand condition at some point just because of the weather. The pens that are in better shape recover faster. They have a process in place to uh, keep those pens drier, to drain better with equipment, to get, get rid of moisture and maintain pen conditions for cattle. Uh, ration characteristics, we want to, uh, most barns, we have to be careful about how easily sorted the ration is. Bunk management is really important in barns, primarily make sure we don't get ahead of cattle, that we are very, where we watch the sensitivity of, of start cattle to start leaving some crumbs. We need to make uh, tweaks in, the, in our feed calls. We need to do that more proactively inside than outside. Water consumption, um, likely less in a barn. That's typically what we measure, but they have to have free access to water and multiple points of access or a lot of uh, space in each pen to allow free access to water. Uh, performance of cattle in barns, we looked at the, at the graphs. There's a wide range, but, but a barn is gonna have the, have the same trend in performance of cattle fed outside. I would say an attribute to cattle that fit barns better, a cattle that have, have a high intake potential. Mud and heat both hurt performance, but, but can be managed around based off of how you handle your bedding and your, your amount of concrete in your pens that uh, potentially could have mud. Heat, uh, shade is outstanding. There are still a lot of, of pens that have sprinkler systems, but um, shade is, is, will improve performance more than water. Water's absolutely better than nothing. Your bedding intelligence, really pay attention to that for those people that bed just because as, as you bed more effectively, you're gonna get, you're gonna get so much more out of each pound of bedding uh, per head per day. Um, and pen to pen movement, uh, critical thing to really watch when managing cattle in confinement barns. Um, so with that, uh, Warren, um, if there's if there are questions or things that we can address before we wrap up, um, uh, I will turn the um, floor over to you for now. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we do have a couple questions in the chat, and so I'll start with the first one. Um, what would your recommendation be for a target uh, for we should maintain for shade? And I'm guessing that I'm I'm interpreting a little bit. I'm thinking they mean uh, uh, square footage. If I'm wrong, I'd hope that person would would uh, correct me and type in another answer or another question. Yeah, it, the typical the typical target's 20 square feet per head. Um, I mean, if, if an animal's in there that eat, that, they, that they could have that much space, seldomly is there ever shade to, for all cattle to get underneath of them. So if you can get, if you have enough shade so that 50% of your cattle minimum can be under shade, that's a great place to start. Um, and the shade needs to be in a place where cattle can easily flow through there because seldomly will all cattle be under the shade. Um, if, if, the cat all, if there's enough shade for all cattle to be under there, they'll still migrate in and out of the shade. Ideally, you'd have enough square foot, square foot for every animal to be in there. So if you had enough, if you had up to 20 square feet per head under shade, it would be uh, absolutely phenomenal. Um, but they're going to stand up underneath there, so you can be tighter than that. Um, so I, I answer, you know, target 20 square feet per head if you possibly can, but have enough shade so a minimum of 50% of the cattle can stand underneath of it uh, throughout the feeding or on those hot days. Tough part is it always takes some money to do all those things. So uh, our other question we have is uh, your thoughts on uh, the dairy style curb feeding. Uh, this uh, questioner feeds, they feed once a day uh, and then push up in the evening uh, so that their fresh feed is uh, being, uh, to try to entice the cattle to come up in uh, something mimicking a, a, a two time a day feeding. If you have any thoughts or data on how a, something like that might compare to a more, more traditional J bunk type setup. The, I don't have any specific data to saying any performance differences. There are, there are feed lots that we've mon that we've measured. Um, what we feel is is lost feed um, from the from the um, the, the non J non 
feed bunk scenario, just feeding on a, a feeding floor. If it's all cement, it's going to be, it should be minimal shrink. There are too many uh, feedlots in this northern feeding region that actually feed on the dirt at, on a, like a curve like that. I think that's that's a bad idea. Um, the but the, the the feeding floor aspect is it it works. There are people that do it. I just think that it's a lot less efficient process and doesn't add to any aspect of performance by just having a regular bunk. All right. Uh, we've got one other question so far. Uh, what would you recommend as your optimum bunk space for receiving high risk cattle? 18 inches is a target, two feet ideal. Um, we just need a lot of space. They are, they're, they're timid. Uh, they don't come to the bunk very um, easily. So you, just, you need a lot of bunk space for those calves. Got another question in the chat box, chat room. Uh, what's your recommendation on square footage per head in an outside pen in Northeast Nebraska? Uh, this particular individual, they're looking at bringing in seven to nine weight feeder cattle. Warren, uh, for just a second, I didn't, ca I didn't catch what you said. Sorry about that. Uh, recommendation on square foot allowment for outside, outside pens, uh, Northeastern Nebraska, seven to nine weight coming in. Uh, more than 300 square feet is ideal. If you have any amount of mud, 350 square feet is, 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 is excellent. Um, but for certainly more than 300 square feet per head just to get cattle spread out. We just see so much better performance when we get cattle to spread out. They, and one aspect of that is not, not, not always performance. It, it, it will be performance, but a, a big deal is just the amount of pen maintenance that you're going to have to have with those Heavier place cattle are going to go to a heavier outweight and be more concentrated. It's tougher on your pen. So 300 square feet um, is, is a minimum. Yeah, I think Dr. Mater's data it said the bigger the pen, the less of the mud issue they had. Uh, yep, yep. Listen to Mater. I don't see anything else in either the Q&A box or in the chat room. And uh, my clock says we're at 1.29 p.m. So unless something pops up here really, really shortly, uh, I think we will wrap this up for this week. Again, thank you to Dr. Lowe for sharing his expertise with us. Uh, really appreciate his willingness to help out. Uh, next week, we'll be talking with uh, Dr. Alfredo Di Constanzo from the University of Minnesota, talking about backgrounding systems and adding value to the crops that, uh, that we raise in integrated systems. Uh, so we're looking forward to a really great discussion next week. Uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, thank everyone for attending and we will send everyone home. Uh, have a safe week and we will see you next week.